<laughs> Hello, one, two, hey. So hey guys, welcome, as August said so eloquently. Um, we are here to talk about mental health, uh, a super important topic in music and generally. Um, and I guess to kick things off, I want to talk to Aiden at first because uh, you guys were involved in this from the start. So do you want to give us a bit of an insight into maybe First of all, why, why are musicians so vulnerable? Because there's some alarming stats. So I work at Help Musicians UK. Um, we're the biggest independent music charity in the country, and I work on the health and welfare team. So we provide grants for people um, with kind of any sort of health and well-being related issue, which is getting in the way of their ability to work or study. Um, mental health last year was the second most common reason that people would apply to us. Um, and it's something that we've been looking at in detail for a few years now. The middle of last year, we finished a piece of research with the University of Westminster and Music Tank. From those interviews, we kind of found a set of themes which really reinforce what a kind of stressful and precarious industry music is. You know, there's the precarious nature of the work, especially if you're working freelance, to kind of worry about where that next job is coming from, the financial concerns that get all tied up with that, the effect it can have on your relationships with, you know, your family or your partner, if you're a bit dependent on them to make your music work, and your colleagues as well. And then there are also a few things which you might think are a bit less obvious, but make a lot of sense. So it's the difficulty engaging, you know, at what point you've been successful in music, you know, because money certainly isn't the only factor that's going to do that. Um, and then there's also kind of a range of other parts, you know, again, which doesn't come as a surprise to anybody, um, how widespread bullying, harassment and such like are um, in the industry. So together you end up with this really kind of potent combination of factors which makes music a particularly difficult environment, as I say, to maintain good mental health. I mean, I guess anything, anything creative tends to have people who can exploit that. I mean, is that something you've seen a lot? People, more people are more likely to work for free because it's their passion and then there's people who will milk that as much as they can. Yeah, there is definitely that really dangerous attitude that you know, you've got to work for free to get anywhere and get that experience. And that's common in a lot of different industries, but I think it's particularly prevalent in music. A lot of the time, people maybe don't necessarily feel um, able to kind of ask for that money straight away for a gig. So you guys set up a helpline, and was it last year after that study? Yeah, so the study finished last year, um, and one of the recommendations that came out of that was um, that, that we, you know, a helpline for specific people in the music industry to help with mental health. So that's called Music Minds Matter. It launched in December last year, so it's almost been a year now. Um, it was one of the most common kind of things which came out the first part of the survey. So 71% of them said that they'd experienced anxiety, had panic attacks, 69% reported feeling depressed. And of that 69%, only 30% said that they'd either already sought help or were very likely to seek help. So it was clear that there was a massive gap. 55% of the people who responded said that there was you know, something missing in terms of mental health provision for musicians and people in the industry. So that's where Music Minds Matter came from. It's completely free for anybody to call. Um, it's open around the clock and you can access kind of various different parts of it. So there's a listening ear. So you call, you'll speak to someone who's trained, who understands the issues which you face in music, whatever your role might be. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess one of the concerns would be around, around finances. I mean, that must be a, a, a common theme. Yeah, money is yeah, one of the things which kind of leads people to make that call to us, either to Music Minds Matter or to the office to kind of ask for help. It's quite rare that we'd help people with kind of only one thing so they may come you know with a health issue if they couldn't work we might be able to help them financially in the interim and that stress you know that not knowing where the next paycheck is coming from yeah. can be really hard to deal with i mean for you for you guys as artists i mean you've obviously been at the forefront of trying to balance the books and also try and find your own self-worth in the studio try and figure out what your money what your music is worth what the product for lack of a better word that you're trying to sell is worth i mean how do you deal with that back and forth in your mind and also how do you deal with the financial like aiden was saying where the next paycheck is coming from a lot of my income comes from gigging you know and i can have um something that looks like a great tour schedule and then a couple of emails later and it you know it it's like dominoes you know you can lose three four gigs like that and because you're getting paid quite a lot for each gig um you know it it can completely destroy your finances and that weighs on my mind a hell of a lot you know and people also say, oh, well, you get that much for a gig. But what they don't realize is you have to pay for, you know, your social media. You have to, or, or 
you know your your PR your you know your promoted posts all that kind of stuff you know so it costs money to be promoting yourself constantly as well um, so yeah it, it you know it is a, a big burden I guess like you know when no one's buying music anymore the only people buying music are DJs and even then the income is very small yeah the artists so you have to start thinking about the gigging culture as your main income therefore does that affect you the tracks you're making because you have to think okay well this has to be play, be able to be played in a club has to be able to get me a booking it kind of restricts your creativity for me personally i have to separate my you know my business mind of the industry from you know my creative mind because if, if i start getting them muddled up then it will you know put me in a position where i freeze in the studio and i can't come up with anything so i think for me I just got to make the music I love. That's that's all I can do, really. Oftentimes, for people who are starting out in their career, you know, come to Point Blank or, you know, just in the first few years of their, their career, you're competing with people like Satek who've been doing it, you know, for decades and have an established career from a previous era because a big thing that's happened is obviously is in the past you know, 10 years plus is that, as, as we've talked about, the money is just leached out of the industry. There's the, the accessibility of the software and whether it be Ableton, Logic, Pro Tools, means that there's that many more people that you're competing with now. So I think we're very quickly seeing this reckoning of the people who are doing it for the right reasons will ultimately stick around long enough because they'd be doing it anyway, even if they weren't be paid. It, it's the classic line, I do this even if I wasn't paid, you know? And I mean, Olga, for, for bigger artists who might be more financially secure, there's still the self-doubt, you know, there's still, does that creep into Luke's life and the other artists you look after? I mean, how do you, can you give us a bit of an insight into how you deal with uh, your artist self-doubt in the studio and creatively? I think that's also one of the most important roles that we fulfill as management. You were talking about how difficult it can be, uh, the challenges of negotiating for yourself. I think if you're talking to somebody about, you know, what you're going to be paid for a gig, for instance, and somebody says, well, I don't think you're worth 500 pounds or whatever it is, that's very personal to you. And for me, it's at more at arm's length and I can negotiate in a more business manner, looking after the artist's interest and also say no or yes when the artist wants to say the reverse. I also always allow my artists to say whatever they want to say when they're out there because they're in the trenches. They're being faced with requests and et cetera. Do you want to do X, Y, or C for me? They're always fine to say whatever they want to say in that situation. Then I'll come in later and be the manager. And then, you know, that's part of what I do. Be, the, be that a-hole and say no. Oh, but the artist said yes, yes, I know. But I'm coming in to say no. Would you have any advice for anyone here who might be in that situation and doesn't have a manager to fall back on? I think, you know, the role of a manager can be fulfilled by so many people. And sometimes it is your best friend, your nephew, your mom, your dad, your brother, who knows you very well and can help you fulfill that role. It doesn't necessarily have to be that well-known or experienced manager, because at that point, what you need is actually just somebody who has your best interest at heart and plays that role of a buffer. So I would always suggest that you look around you in your network for somebody just to help you out even just to help you answer emails be a little bit of a filter between that which allows you to just focus on what it really is that you want to do which is be an artist yeah i mean i guess that kind of leads into dealing with rejection which i know we're going to talk about a little bit i mean how how do you how do you deal with a bad dj say or a bad show live show 10 15 years ago it was like 90 percent of the gigs were playing to nobody or you know playing in some club where people were like have you got any r&b you know and i'm playing techno you know that and that, you know uh, you know that sorry about that mate. yeah yeah and uh, you know that that used to destroy me you know um and you know rejection used to destroy me i used to um, let it really, really eat me up, you know, to points where like a week later, I'll still be really depressed about it and talking about it. You know, I'd see one person on social media saying, you know, that Satek thing is shit or, or whatever, and it would destroy me. And I think over time, I've managed to build up a thick skin, you know, and I think that's something that has taken me a lot of time to get to that place where it's not that I don't care, but I care much less now, you know. I, I've got perspective, I think that's the thing, you know. Yeah, okay, yeah. that show wasn't that great, but actually my last, you know, seven, eight shows have been amazing, so it's okay, it's not my fault. 
whereas before it would be 100% my fault and I'm a bad artist, you know, I'm, I'm a bad person and it would like feed into this kind of, you know, like you said, self-worth and, you know, my self-worth would be on the, on the floor, you know. Do you have any advice to anyone here who, to how to deal with that bad gig? I mean, it's, it can be a very lonely journey home after a bad gig and also the ho- going back to the hotel room and your ears are still ringing and, you know, that, those are the moments that it can be at its lowest after a bad gig. I think, you know, maybe even if you can take pen to paper and, you know, write, you know, the, the reality of the situation, you went to the show, the promoter didn't promote it properly, so no one turned up. You know, that's not your fault. You know, you went to a show and you did it in a, you know, in a club where they play R&B every weekend and you're playing techno, so it's not the right sound, you know. So it's about getting some perspective on the reality of the situation. You know, not every gig is going to be great. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just, for me, it took time, but um, I think that's what I did over time. I, I got perspective over the reality of the situation. Yeah. And Olga, I mean, even, even for big artists like Luke, there's still bad shows, right? One of the things that we do is manage artists' expectations. You know, in the lead up to a gig, we will have contact with the promoter, ask them how it's going, what is ticket sales looking like. If it's shaping up, to, to be, you know, a not full gig. First of all, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of conversation about what we, can we do to make it look good. But if it is what it is, then we have the conversation. And I think that's also part of it and explain why maybe there was bad weather, maybe there was a lot of competition, uh, maybe the timing isn't right or, or whatever. But go in and know what you can expect is part of, you know, understanding and surrounding yourself with good people who are giving you that feedback. And I think another important factor is preparation and a lot of trial and error. It, it does shape you. I think if you're faced with a crowd is not really connecting with what you're playing, if you're an experienced DJ, that'll give you some tools to deal with that. A lot of kids going in, they've had one record, s- do successfully on, on radio or on Spotify or wherever, doesn't automatically qualify them as a good performing artist. So they're thrown into uh, a gig, sold a lot of tickets on the back of that hit, but they're not prepared for what the performance brings. So practicing, I think, is also key. And practice can be, you know, at your niece's birthday, in your local pub, for you to understand your equipment, understand the technical uh, aspects of, of, of your tools, but then also to practice how to play to a crowd. Those are all things that I think can help towards what you're experiencing. And again, that buffer role, you know, if you are literally doing everything yourself and you're getting all that criticism straight to you, unfiltered, at a time when I think you're pouring your heart out as an artist on that stage, that's, you're extremely vulnerable that way. Yeah, I mean, that kind of leads into talking about social media a little bit. I mean. Uh, Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the effects of social media you've seen through the Musicians' Union? Absolutely. Um, Giving yourself some time off from it, you know. That is ultimately part of your job. So you would finish your job at a certain time, so finish on social media at a certain time. And don't put the pressure on yourself that you feel you have to respond to everything, to think you have to look at everything, and really be assessing, you know, why you're putting a post out. Is there there a reason behind it, you know, or are you just doing it for for the sake of it? I think you have to... Uh, take close attention to that um, but yes it, it is ultimately really important we got to remember if it's part of your job there should be a time where you where you stop we're told so much about social media numbers affecting bookings and affecting your fee a lot of the time is that the case I mean it seems to be especially in local gigs well yes socials uh, the DJ Mag top 100 in certain markets is you know by far one of the leading uh, templates that are looked at but I agree with you. I, I actually don't even think it's effective to be so constantly engaging. It's much more important to have a plan for your socials. I think that's genuinely one of the best bits of advice you could give to any artist. Like everyone's got their own sort of, you know, self-care regime, kind of things that they do which make them feel better. But creating that balance and just having set periods of time where you're not on social media, you're not looking at that, you're just, you know, switching off, doing whatever you do, playing sport, just listening to music, you know, by yourself in your room in the dark, whatever it might be. Because we come across so many people who, exactly as you say, will 
maybe have a you know great gig 99 percent of the feedback is brilliant but that one thing again like you were saying earlier keeps them up all night and really really sticks with people uh, declan's right social media you know entertainment products they're not the devil but it's never been more important than ever before to be careful about how you spend your time in, in a productive manner in a way that will sustain you and make you feel good about yourself we could talk about more about this but we have to move on because of time but i mean i just want to quickly the final thing i kind of want to talk about today is about substance abuse and substance use and abuse i should say i mean a lot of the touring when you're on tour there's a lot of pressures um not just pressures actually it's it's fun <laughs> fun to be on tour. Uh, you want to go to the after party. You want to hang out with people, meet new people, and talk about music and stuff. Um, but of course, doing that every single day for um, maybe, say, two, three weeks uh, has a massive detrimental effect on your well-being uh, physically, but also if you do within that process have some bad shows or uh, it's not going well, the tour generally, uh, it can very easily get to breaking point quite fast, right? Yeah, um, I, you know, I'm in recovery myself, so, you know, I've been, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of drugs really, really took control for me. Um, and I can say that, you know, when um, I'm touring now, even without drink and drugs, it's tiring. You know, it takes a lot out of you, um, you know, especially if you're doing a couple of shows in, um, in one weekend or whatever. You know, you're going from to one club. You're staying up all night, maybe get an hour or two kip in a hotel, fly to another club, and then maybe you only get an hour or two kip again and you have to fly home, you know, so it's a, it takes its toll anyway. So when you start, you know, staying up, or, you know, adding drugs and alcohol to that anyway, you know, it can be, um, yeah, it can really, really, you can end up in a really, really dark place. Yeah, I mean, there's been a quite, a lot of high profile artists recently coming out. I mean, Luciano being, the the one that, that comes to mind and he put a, a post on Facebook but it, he, he actually didn't tell anyone he was in rehab until he was a year he was out, out of it for a year but the, the reason I bring it up is because I was talking to him about it and he uh, he just said that what, what basically it's you know where if you're if you're socially uncomfortable generally anyway and you you don't have a tour manager with you which most people want at the beginning um, you are going to have some lubrication so that you can because you have to go for dinner with the promoter and you know you have a couple of drinks and then you're tired so you know you end up taking some drugs to stay awake to get the show done and then it just becomes an association with what you're doing rather than it stops the initial form might have been to socially lubricate or keep talking stay awake and then it's just you can't do it without it and, and also i think there is a lot of addiction in the industry as well and you know you're like you say maybe without your tour manager maybe your tour, tour manager is using as well and everyone can like use together and uh you know so there's a lot of that kind of uh that that goes on in the industry and people with problems that can get kind of buried because it's socially acceptable in you know especially in dance music to be taking drugs basically and drinking all night so it's you know you i can't think of any other job or many other jobs where you could uh you know go and you could drink while you're working and you know take drugs when you're working and it's kind of expected of artists to do it so um you know there's a some people can use recre you know they can have recreational drug use whereas other people it becomes a big problem for them and that can get hidden in the industry and it can be given a big thumbs up you know and when i used to do shows and i was you know getting out of it it's almost like i got credibility because i had to be carried out the club or you know um you know i was at the after party for three days and i missed my plane or i missed my train you know that was that was cool people spoke about that as if that was a a good thing but you know that that is something that is is not a good thing it's you know it's, it's an addiction and it's a problem yeah. and there's going to be some you know to your, to your managers or or agents especially who just want you to keep doing the shows because that's what their livelihood relies on and they might they might push your uh clear issues to kind of trying to convince you that it's fine or not not take the right action i've been in the business long enough to to see uh when that was very prevalent but now that the dance music industry has become so big and so commercialized there's institutional uh, investors now a lot of our contracts rule that out with big repercussions most agents most managers will in fact not want to risk uh, somebody who has who's suffering from from issues related to substance abuse but the problem to me isn't so much the substance abuse because it's a symptom like you said usually when you get to speak to somebody there's a whole array of problems that causes anxieties and it's just 
a kind of a self-medication that you're that you're doing to deal with the anxiety that's underlying i was going to say as well you know conversations like this are massively important and, and what we try and do is encourage more of these conversations going into colleges and, and speaking to people as well referring people to organizations like music support um, encouraging people to give us a call so uh, yeah i think that's massively important to have these conversations at the earliest possible stage and I think, you know, maybe that's true at the top level, but I think in the underground scene, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, people, a lot, when I'm touring, I still see a lot of DJs that are really, really pushing the drugs and the alcohol to the limits. And, yeah. you know, um, they may not be, you know, they may not have managers or agents. So, um, and, but I agree with you that, you know, because as, as a, someone in recovery, I know that it is just a symptom of the outside stuff, but if it's allowed to continue and there's people around you saying it's okay. And are enabling that, but I'm seeing more and more promoters, even at the lower level, we're not just doing like the big EDM stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a risk. Even if it's a couple of hundred pounds, that's a risk for somebody that he can't afford to just wait if you're gonna show up, if you're gonna finish the set or, you know, just, not perform because of that and you know it only goes that far where people have a laugh about it and tell each other on twitter because at the same time they go well you know this is the time when ibiza people used to do pre-parties just for the pure reason yeah. did the dj actually make it to the island is he actually in shape to perform tonight you know but even at that underground level uh, or even at a smaller level promoters are weighing their money uh, that you can get away with that maybe once or twice, but a lot of those guys from back then have disappeared. Uh, I'd like to pass the microphone to all of you uh, so that you can ask your own questions. Uh, so who would like to start asking any questions in the audience? So um, would you have any tips on how to balance better between music and the rest of your life? Because for me, I feel like lately, I, because it's your passion, you give it your all, of course, but sometimes I feel like less could be more, and I find it stressful to admit that to myself, that it's less is more or can be more, so any tips on that? I would say just give, your, you know, give yourself a break, because you know, to make good music, you need inspiration, and to get inspiration, you need to live. So if you're locked in the studio 24-7, then at some point, you're just, you know, your inspiration will probably dry up. So you need to get out there and live and just give yourself a little bit of a break and do the things you enjoy in life and see that as something that's actually good for your creativity and good for your music. So if you can see that as part of the music process, then that's probably a good thing. Any more questions? We still have a microphone. Hey there. Uh, firstly, thanks a lot. It's been really, really stimulating. Um, and I'm really glad that the drug issue was brought up because We've lost so many great musicians to drugs in the past. Uh, so my, my question is basically primarily to uh, Olga and Aidan. It's like, uh, do you have preemptive strategies, like assertive ways of, of helping people bef when you see a problem developing and when you are informed by someone who's contacted you and you have sort of your concerns and they're very real concerns, do you have a strategy like pointing people in the right direction, recovery programs? How do you guys, do you have a strategy for that? Is, it, is there advice you could put forward? The support we provide people, we're really fortunate to be able to tailor to their needs. So it would very much depend on what the person came to us um, about, where they were at in their lives and just sort of the realities of the situation. So sort of going back to the question earlier, if someone was concerned about drugs, for instance, we might say, you know, we might recommend they get in touch with music support. We might, um, you know, as you say, there's pro there may well be an underlying mental health issue there. So we might kind of usually quite gently encourage them to um, look at counselling, look at talking to someone. And as I mentioned earlier, that's the sort of thing we can fund as well. Um, but it does depend to quite a significant extent on that person. This is a big part of the reason we visit um, every professional musician that we help kind of as early on in the relationship as you can. Because there's a lot of stuff kind of, you know, if you're communicating with someone by email or even on the phone that you may not pick up on. So if I, whereas if I meet someone for a coffee or around their house, then you're able to kind of 
get a better idea of the whole situation people may well mention things which they wouldn't mention on the phone or in an email and you can sort of read kind of what the best way is going to be to help that person get the help that they need and then by extension how we can fit into that usually when we on the management are confronted with these issues it's it's before they have recognized there is an issue at all basically the way it usually uh, unfolds itself is a never-ending list of new issues that are supposedly going to change everything and make it easier. And it starts with, you know, uh, well, I need I need an extra day of travel so I can unwind. I need business class. I need to fly private. I need to have my cook on the road or my dancer or whatever. That's going to make the difference, and it never does. And then you get the destructive behavior, the drugs, the alcohol, you know, the, the trips to the hospital because you've got a chest infection infection and you're still smoking and you're still drinking very destructive uh, and still not really saying there's a problem there's always a reason that explains the behavior according to the person in that situation i can't contri keep contributing to this you know and now we can still make this decision together uh, you can take control over, uh, your, over your destiny or i find it no longer responsible uh, responsible i will either make you quit or i'm bowing out and that's how we did it ultimately. And it was definitely for the better. And certainly it didn't suddenly change everything because only now we could deal with the underlying issues. There isn't a template of how to deal with it. And it's live and learn. Yeah, it took me years to understand what was going on then. He didn't get it, I didn't get it. We had to go through all of that for me to now recognize when that's happening. We've got time for one more if anyone has one. So this question would be for uh, Saytech and Sam as artists and producers. Um, how do you kind of motivate yourself when you're feeling your lowest to get back in the studio and really be creative? It is hard. When you're tired, it's hard to be creative. Um, but I think you touched on something when you said you haven't been looking after yourself. And I think that's maybe you should spend some time to actually make sure you try and look after yourself. And I think if you spend that time you know, making sure that you, whatever it is, whatever you need to do to look after yourself better, um, and then plan times when you can be creative, um, and also, you know, don't beat yourself up about it as well, because in my experience, when I start beating myself up about not being creative, it freezes me and I can't be creative. So I think it's just, you know, about being a little bit kinder to yourself and looking after yourself better, and then, you know, giving yourself, rather than going out on the weekend or something like that, say, right, this weekend, I'm going to get a good night's sleep and I'm going to get up and I'm going to spend the whole weekend in the studio and just, you know, put that, make that a priority. Yeah. First one is, is um, actually sort of a bit of a behavioralist sort of, uh, sort of thought, which is sort of on habit formation, which is that you can, and this also to everybody else, you can sort of, hotwire your brain if you make a commitment to yourself maybe just to do five minutes i've personally done this in the past and found it to be immensely rewarding where each day even if you spend five minutes ten minutes at the moment you're feasting and famining so you'll have like when you do sit down you got five hours you burn yourself out you crash and then you, what you'll find is, is if each day you're coming back and picking up the thread uh, Ernest Hemingway also did the same thing where he would finish in the middle of a sentence so when he sat down the next day he knew exactly where to sort of pick up and the more consistent you can be, the better re results will be. Because you'll end, otherwise you'll end up cannibalizing what it is you did last time. Cool, last one. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for questions. But uh, please give it up for Sam, Olga, Aiden. Sam again. I'm a state tech. <laughs>